Okay, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Welcome to uh, today's webinar, Voting During a Pan the, excuse me, Pandemic Technologies Role. Uh, my name is Craig Vaughn, and uh, I'm the president of CASEL. For those of you who don't know CASEL, uh, we manage HOAs, uh, about 300 HOAs, condominiums and apartments in the Florida and Texas markets through uh, seven different offices and approximately 750 teammates. Um, I'll be your host uh, this afternoon. I'm going to play board member uh, for, the, for the group here. Um, before uh, we get to our other panelists, I want to thank you first uh, for your leadership. Uh, these are exciting times. I'm sure none of you expected to have to deal with what you're dealing with when you signed up to be a board member. You went for all the perks and didn't realize there was going to be all this work to do. So uh, thank you for staying engaged and involved. Thank you for your thirst for information and time this afternoon um, to get an update on technology's role during this uh, pandemic. We have lots of questions we got from you when you registered and we've incorporated those into the talking points for the presentation. Um, and then we, uh, as, as Shauna explained, we have a Q and A feature on the Zoom platform. You're welcome to uh, chat in your questions and we'll try and work those into the conversation um, as we go through this afternoon. Um, and then we're, we're hoping to have some time at the end to answer some specific questions. I wanted to acknowledge that we understand that you're volunteers and, and you're acting in that capacity. No, no one's expecting you to be uh, experts at what you do. Uh, there are rules um, in place that actually protect you in this situation uh, relative to just uh, um, exercising sound business judgment. We may talk a little bit about that as we move through it, but um, you know, this is a good example of sound business judgment. You, you're considering this particular topic and you're listening in on a webinar and we're going to advise you to reach out to your particular uh, experts as well. So um, that's a, a comment for board members. We are using the Zoom platform this afternoon. We do check in with Zoom before we uh, start to see other platforms running. It is running fine, which is good news. Uh, the bad news is sometimes it moves and so if you happen to have a problem or encourage, uh, excuse me, if you get into any difficulty, uh, we're gonna uh, advise you, which is very simple. Our recommendation is log on and log off. I, I have an IT team, I pay to give me that advice and it's excellent advice. That's normally the solution to the problem. And I'm sure Brett can comment on some software issues for us this afternoon. And then before I ask David and, and Brett to introduce themselves, I want, will wanna say to you that we're just having a conversation this afternoon I know David doesn't intend to be giving specific legal advice for your association. He's going to give us some guidance. Um, you know, Brett and I, we, rep we represent specific service providers in, the, in our industry, but we're here to have a conversation with you and provide our opinion on, you know, what's going on out there with respect to our clients and, and, and our particular products. Uh, I would encourage you to seek out, you know, your professionals if you decide to implement some of the recommendations we're going to make um, this afternoon on online voting and, and technology tools. So Brett, um, why don't I start with you? Now Brett fooled us because he sent us a panelist picture that didn't look anything like him. So I'm pretty sure this is somebody masquerading as Brett, but Brett, right. tell us about yourself um, and your company. Well, notwithstanding the fact that I've been locked up in the house for uh, going on two months. <laughs> I am, I am Brett. And uh, I do appreciate being here. Thank you so much for including me. Uh, my name is Brett Philo. I am a co-founder of Shift. We're a digital development and digital marketing agency. Uh, we have partnered with the, the Becker firm to build Becker Ballad, which is one of the options in the market for electronic voting, online voting. Uh, my goal today is just to speak briefly to the features and benefits of online voting generally. I'm happy to answer any questions specific to online voting. Um, we did develop the platform from the ground up. Uh, we did follow the guidance of the Becker team and have adhered to the specific Florida requirements, although it is a fairly generic platform. So I can speak to how to vote online, uh, how to facilitate or manage a vote online, um, and the technologies involved. And uh, I'm happy to do that today. And, and, and as I said, I do appreciate being here. Thank you. Well, we're happy to have you, and we'll look forward to getting into a, a, a dialogue around electronic voting. David, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, and we know you're with Becker, which is uh, uh, renowned in our industry, but tell us about yourself and your practice. Sure, and uh, let me begin by saying, Craig and, and Castle, I appreciate the invitation and uh, the, you know, getting the, the seminar, the webinar uh, going. Uh, 
definitely appreciate the invitation and happy to chat with you all about this today. Uh, this topic, uh, as Craig mentioned, my name is David Muller. I'm with the law firm of Becker and Polykoff. Uh, my primary office location is in the Naples office, but uh, I represent associations up and down the west coast of Florida. Um, the firm is obviously a, it's a national firm now. We have multiple offices throughout Florida. Uh, we also have offices now in uh, New York, New Jersey, and Washington, D.C. Uh, and the, the bedrock of the firm is representation of uh, community associations. I'm a partner with the firm, been with the firm for 15 years. I'm board certified in uh, condominium and plan development law. And so this is, uh, this is what I do all day, every day. So I'm happy to chat with you all. Well, David, you've maintained your youthful look through this. Uh, I would have never guessed 15 years as a partner at Becker. So congratulations. Um, <laughs> give a better workout routine than I do. Um, <laughs> so guys, this afternoon, we do uh, want to cover uh, an agenda I've got the legal environment uh, permitting the use of technology, framework to adopt electronic voting in your community, why it makes sense, how it works, other opportunities, and then um, any questions. So why don't we jump right in? You know, the timing for discussion on electronic voting could not be, could not be better, I don't think. I would say three short months ago, we were really just starting to get some traction on the electronic voting platform. It was still new to management companies, still new to associations, and uh, still in its infancy. So now uh, we see a short three months later, we're right in the middle. We have a whole bunch of CDC guidelines around social distancing and gathering, um, and the board still has to exercise its fiduciary duty to have meetings and make decisions. So I don't think there's a better, better way to con conduct elections um, in this particular environment than from an elect electronic voting standpoint. So let's jump in. David, I'm going to ask you, can you give us a brief overview of the legal environment that allows associations to vote electronically? Right. right. So the law was changed in 2015. Florida statutes, which are listed here for you on the PowerPoint, uh, they were changed in 2015 to allow for electronic voting. Uh, electronic voting really didn't get going, though, until a little bit later. It, it, it took some time for there to be additional rules established, particularly from the Division of Condominiums, as far as some of the intricacies and nuances of electronic voting. So those nuances came, you know, about six to 12 months later and, uh, you know, really became operational about 2016 or so. And candidly, you know, with electronic voting, it really started going uh, in, in 2017. Um, so we have seen it obviously grow over the number of years. Uh, the increase in the percentage of my clients that are using it grows every year. Um, obviously the electronic voting platforms, which Brett's gonna talk about, those have evolved as well. So it's like anything else that's, that's new. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to iron out some kinks, but uh, we feel we definitely have iron the kinks out and, uh, you know, candidly, my clients that are choosing to utilize electronic voting, you know, they, they are by and large happy with it. And, uh, you know, the, the bad analogy I'll give is it's kind of like jumping in the deep end of the swimming pool. You know, it's a little scary at first, but once you do it, you don't think twice about it. I, I think, you know, I think there is some confusion as well, which I, I hope we can alleviate some of that confusion today about, you know, just how it feeds into the current, uh, the current voting system that you have. Are there any, you kind of said the statute's fine. Are there any restrictions that might be in my documents that would affect my ability to implement uh, or, or, or implement electronic voting, excuse me? Right, good question. You know, the, the key with these statutes is with the statutes, it does not require you to amend your documents to provide for electronic voting. It just says now in the statute, you can vote electronically. Uh, and, and chances are, since electronic voting is somewhat of a new concept, chances are your documents are silent on the issue. Uh, but it is important, um, you know, we're giving you the framework here, giving you a taste of how it works with any issue, particularly this one. It is important to check in with your association attorney. Uh, you know, I know that not, sounds self-serving, but it doesn't mean it's not true uh, to, to talk to them about whether or not you're interested in doing this and some things you might want to uh, discuss as far as policies and procedures. So the short answer to your question is the statutes require the, the statutes allow for it now, and your governing documents will not prohibit you from taking this step. Excellent. A couple of quick hits from questions we got uh, emailed into us during the registration process. Um, do elections have to be held during an annual meeting? 
Right, and so this is interesting. I think most of our audience here today are condominiums and uh, homeowners associations. And of course, there's a wide variety of different associations out there. Uh, I'll focus on the Condominium Association and Homeowners Association Acts. Uh, the, the Condominium Act requires the election to occur at the annual meeting. Uh, interestingly enough, the Homeowners Association says the same, the Homeowners Association Act says the same thing, except it does give deference to your governing documents in the Homeowners Association setting. So the, the law is a little bit different, but for all intents and purposes, the annual meeting is held, uh, I'm sorry, the election is held at the annual meeting. Now, don't get confused, in the condominium setting, you need 20% of your owners to vote to actually have an election. That's different, of course, than a quorum that is needed for conducting a membership meeting. So you, you could actually have an election if you get to the 20% marker, uh, but if you don't reach your quorum that's mandated by your own governing documents, you might not actually have a membership meeting. So I know sometimes there's a little confusion on that point. Um, is there any uh, differences in establishing quorum? Does it make it easier if you're utilizing an electronic voting platform? Well, establishing or confirming what your quorum is, is, is obviously important. Um, you know, for most of my associations, it's a majority, right? But it, it doesn't have to be. It can be a, a lower number than that. But, uh, you know, the, the key from my standpoint with electronic voting is educating your owners and getting them to do it at least for the first time. Because once they do it for the first time, it will become, you know, second nature for them. And I really feel that once you've done it a time or two, it's going to dramatically increase participation in membership meetings, uh, votes and all of the things that you have uh, that are transpired in membership meetings. It really will help because instead of having to worry about licking envelopes and uh, shuffling paper, you just simply press a couple buttons on your computer. Well, uh, Brett is actually later going to take us through actually how it works. So we'll look forward to that. And Brett, I promise I will get to you. I want to get through some of these legal things. I hope you don't mind. Um, mm -hmm. The seminar is primarily about electronic voting, which is a board decision, uh, David, I think. <clears throat> if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. There is an opportunity for individual uh, owners to participate in these new technologies that are around um, when they're interacting with the association. Can you talk a little bit about an owner's election to accept official correspondence uh, by, uh, you know, the digital platform? Right. So one important distinction um, that is often confused is electronic voting is different than electronic notification of membership meetings, right? Agreeing to electronic notification of membership meetings has been around for a long time. And basically what that means is if you're an owner, like for example, I live in an HOA and I have consented to receive notices uh, electronically. So I know the notice for the membership meeting and the election balloting and all of that. I know that that's not going to be necessarily coming to my mailbox, my physical mailbox. I'm on the lookout for it in my inbox. Um, so there is a distinction for almost all communities who want to vote electronically, you want to also offer not only the right for owners to vote electronically, but also you want to confirm that they are receiving notices electronically. Uh, you, you want to do it all electronically. You don't want to piecemeal it. And that's part of the process. Uh, but again, they're two separate concepts. But when you vote electronically, you're as an owner consenting to not only receive the notifications electronically, but actually how you physically vote is done electronically as well. It's a great distinction in that um, they do go hand in hand. And I think it's important for our participants to understand it's not absolute. If the association decides to utilize a technology platform, not everybody has to. If an owner decides, an owner, it's an own individual owner choice to decide to accept correspondence, official correspondence by electronic or normal uh, snail mail, if you will. Uh, it isn't absolute. You don't have to choose one. Is that correct? It is correct. One of the number one things I hear from a client when I discuss with them electronic voting, you know, particularly my Southwest Florida clients, they'll say, hey, we, we have a very high percentage of, uh, you know, an elderly population here at our association. Many of them don't even have email addresses. So how are they going to vote electronically? And it's important to remember that although the board approves, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, the board approves whether to give the option to the owners to vote electronically the ultimate decision after the board decides to offer that option, the ultimate decision rests with the owner. 
So the owner does not, you cannot force an owner to vote electronically, which means you will still be conducting a meeting the old school way with the paper and the envelopes for those members who simply don't want to do it. If they want to do it the old way, you have to allow it. David, I think that's a great distinction. And there is a, been, there was clearly some confusion in the registration question. So that's great clarification. And, and thank you for that. I think from our standpoint, Castle, you know, we really see the cost offset of people electing to get their official correspondence by digitally or by email can easily pay for the platform to be able to vote electronically. So they do go hand in hand, I think, and, and make a lot of sense. We're going to comment on cost uh, later, but Brett, let's move to you if I can, why does it make sense for an association to utilize an electronic, uh, an electronic balloting platform? That's a great question. And, and I think you've already alluded to some of those answers. Um, certainly, you'll, you'll increase your member participation. I, I think right out of the gate, uh, it's easier. Uh, folks can vote from wherever, uh, what, whatever location is convenient for them. I know that we have a particularly mobile population. Um, especially in Florida, you've got a lot of folks who have second homes, uh, may still want to participate, but may not be physically in the state. So electronic voting affords them the ability to do that easily without paper, without mailing. Uh, I do think it is a little less expensive uh, relative to preparing all those packages and, and, and mailing them out. So once you, uh, once you pass that pivot point, you know, there's, there's definitely an inflection point where you'll still have a number of people participating on paper, even though you've rolled out electronic voting. Um, once you get past that point, it becomes significantly less expensive to maintain moving forward. Uh, and, I, and I do think it does uh, reduce the overall level of effort, both from an administ administrator, uh, there's less paper to, to deal with, there's less manual counting to deal with. Uh, I think that helps reduce the potential for error. Uh, although I know everybody's very careful and very focused. You know, the fact that you get a report spit out from the system and it gives you your exact tally, uh, can provide or expose other data, including um, you know, a, a time and date stamp for a vote. So in the event somebody submits paper inadvertently, you can compare that. Um, I think all of those things combined provide a much uh, easier and seamless experience, reduce overhead, reduce time, uh, margin of error goes down. Uh, and it is important to note, uh, although mail is, you know, once you seal that envelope and send it off into the mail, ostensibly that is secure. Uh, this is a secure uh, transaction as well. We use the same type of security and most voting platforms do uh, that you're used to seeing when you purchase something on Amazon. It's that same encrypted transaction. So uh, you can't steal a password. You can't sniff out that, that transaction. Um, and I think that affords a level of um, comfort and certainty that the vote's being uh, recorded appropriately and that there's no potential issue there. I think, you know, there's no, there's very little downside, really no downside from what I, I can tell what our clients have seen. And I think the reality is it's just getting over that fear, the initial fear of it's change and people don't like change and I'm getting old, so I don't like change. So it becomes harder and, and harder. David, uh, we've heard, you know, some believe that this is really a setup for large associations. Um, what are you advising your smaller clients? Right. So candidly, early on in the process, um, you know, my first clients that, uh, that dipped their toe into the deep end of the pool were the very large condo association with, you know, hundreds of units, and some of them had not been able to achieve a quorum in years and had not, you know, on a few occasions, had not even had enough for the 20% threshold for the elections. So when this first came about, their mentality was, you know, why the heck not? I mean, we've got nothing else to lose. Uh, we, you know, if we, it might help us actually have our first election or have a, a quorum for the first time in a while. And so they aggressively embraced this. And uh, it, it did result for the, the, few clients I'm thinking about that have done it consistently over the past, you know, several years, um, you know, we have had a membership meeting, we've had an annual meeting and an election when there was a, enough candidates each of those years. So it was successful. But turning back to your question, you know, it's not just a big community deal. I mean, smaller communities can really benefit from this. And the obvious reason for that is if you're a smaller association, you know, 10 to 50 units, um, you really do have the ability to track down, you know, 
all the owners and, and try to get them to consent to this. And uh, I have a couple of clients that have done that and they don't, if you've got every owner consenting to electronic notification for membership meetings, and then you also offer electronic voting, guess what? For those communities, paper is a thing of the past when it comes to the membership meetings and, and the annual meetings. Right. Uh, so candidly, I only have a couple of it that are like that, but I do believe at some point, you know, paper is going to be obsolete. It really is. And I think the pandemic and COVID-19 have really accelerated the demise of paper. Right. Um, Brett, you've got clients across the state and all over the country. What are you seeing in terms of your client mix, small, large? How, you know, I'm sure you keep those, those stats. What do you see from your standpoint? Uh, yeah, I have a handful that are that are very small. I would qualify as very small, 50, 75 units. Um, and to David's point, it, it's been a great success for them. They've been able to get 80, 90% adoption, um, even on their first vote, because they've, they've, they have a list of everybody who's acknowledged that they want to participate electronically. And if they haven't activated their account, or they haven't cast their ballot during the defined voting period. They can generate a list of emails. Uh, they can email them from the association email address or because it's such a small association, they, they know everybody, they can track them down and ask them to participate. So I think um, for the smaller associations, it's been quite helpful because they've been able to rapidly get great adoption, even, a, even the first time using electronic voting. We do have a handful of what I'd qualify as very large associations, a thousand or more. Um, the numbers are a little different there, but you're dealing with significantly larger groups. And in, in that type of a scenario, you're going to expect that there are going to be a handful of folks that don't have email addresses. There are going to be another handful of folks that simply don't want to do it electronically. Um, but early, very early on in the product's life, uh, we did hear from an association that was able to achieve a quorum and it had been the first time in something like eight years. Uh, and th that's a large association. I think they were eight, eight or 900 folks. So um, it, does, it does run the gamut. I, I definitely do see larger associations, 500 or more using it. Um, but as, as indicated, you know, there are definitely a, a number of smaller associations and they seem to have quicker adoption earlier in the process. I think it's just easier for them to track those folks down. Well, I think that's a great point. And, you know, one of the things we've, uh, Castle, we've kind of um, really focused in on capturing people's email address. That seems to be the mode of communication. You know, the whole uh, COVID uh, pandemic situation is, is really crying for communication. So that has really helped. And I think that's a start in the process. I will also say, and an answer to a question, uh, from one of our participants today, you know, we track at Castle when if you elect to take uh, get uh, electronic correspondence or get digital communication, we track that ourselves. That's our job as your management company to track it. So when we go to mail out the package, we don't mail it to everybody who's elected to get electronically. We only mail it to those who haven't elected to do that, and everybody else gets it. Um, everyone else gets it. It gets it uh, electronically. So. That cost, uh, the cost of, of moving to this platform, this, these technology uses really become zero very quickly to the point where in a large association, you can actually save a bunch of money uh, by moving to the platform and we'll get into cost. Okay, guys, so now we've established that the, uh, the statute allows it. There's no restrictions in my documents. Um, I want to go. I want to, um, I want the owners to be able to invite, to invite, to vote electronically. David, what do I need to do as a board to, to get this thing going? Right. So the first step is if the board wants to offer this to the owners, that decision needs to be made at a board meeting. And the statute does require 14 days mailed notice for that board meeting where the board makes that decision. So as we all know in the community association world, most board meetings are 48 hours notice. Uh, there are a couple of board meetings that require this heightened notice, the 14 days. And so this is one more of uh, one more of those board meetings that requires the 14 days advance notification. So you fire off that notice, you have your board meeting, the board approves uh, the use of or the offering of electronic voting. And um, as part of that, the board 
the best practice is for the board at that same meeting to approve the utilization of the consent and revocation forms, right? And so this is another example of uh, an area where you need to talk with your attorney and make sure that the forms are gonna match up with the platform that you've utilized. And wh what am I getting at? Those consent and revocation forms, those are the forms that the owner fills out when they say to the association, we want to vote electronically, right? And those forms contain some of the details. You know, for example, one of the important details is going to be uh, at what point in time can you no longer vote electronically, right? Uh, an example you could put in that form, you have the ability to vote electronically up until an hour before the membership meeting, right? Now, we're probably going to get questions later on. I think we're going to cover this later on in the, in the webinar. Uh, well, what happens if you want to change votes? And what happens if I show up at the membership meeting and I want to actually vote in person instead of what I've done electronically? You know, we're going to get to all that. But back to your question, it's that first board meeting, you, the 14-day notice, the board approves, offering this as an option. And we recommend as a best practice that the board approve the forms they're going to use for owners to make this consent. Okay, so now I'm in, the board's voted. We're, we're, we're on. We've hired Brett um, and Becker to make it happen. What do, so as an owner, what specifically do I need to do? Just fill out the consent form and, and wait for my ballot to arrive in my email? Right. So as, a, as an owner, you fill out that form and then you will, if you've consented to receive notices electronically and you also have consented to vote electronically, you'll need to be monitoring your, your email inbox uh, you know, to, to get those notifications. Uh, back to the board meeting when the board decides what they're going to do, it's also recommended that they decide on who the third party partner is, uh, that they're going to, uh, the platform they're going to utilize to vote electronically. And then, of course, the board also needs to decide which membership meetings uh, they're going to offer this new option, you know, wh which membership meeting they're going to utilize uh, or offer this option for. And that's where timing comes in, right? So if your annual meeting is coming up, you know, you need to make these decisions before the first notice for a condo anyway, which we all know is 60 days. You need to be making these decisions in advance of the 60-day deadline, right? Because all of the notices that go out need to make reference to the option for electronic voting. As far as how it actually works, you know, I'm sure Brett will uh, you know, give some of the details there. Brett, that's a great question, and, and it is my question. So we, we're in a condo. I have to have my 60-day notice. Um, Brett, when do we need to engage our third-party partner and, and start to make sure we understand it? So is it 15 days? Is it 30 days? What works best from your standpoint, and what are the milestones? Sure. Uh, you, you know, from our perspective, as long as we have uh, access to your voter roster, now, the, just to back up, the, the tools are designed, the, the administrative tools to upload your voter roster and, and create your online ballot are built so that a vote administrator, uh, somebody in the property management office, uh, whomever's uh, designated to manage the vote, they're designed so that they can be self-managed. So um, they're form-based, relatively straightforward tools. However, we will always uh, create the voter roster. We will always upload that, make sure that it's correct, work with uh, the designated rep to, to make sure everything looks correct. And then we'll also create the ballot. Uh, it usually takes, uh, and uh, you know, thankfully uh, my coworkers aren't here to kick me under the table. It usually <laughs> takes about an hour to create the ballot and upload a voter roster and make sure everything is set up and looks right, you know, between, uh, the, you know, the hardest part is typically making the voter roster that comes from our client match the bulk upload template and get that loaded into the system. Right. So, you know, if at the 60 day notice, which is not likely, you had a voter roster ready to go, you could engage us we'd have your roster loaded and in the system so that when you were ready to go live with your ballot, the day voting open, uh, you'd be able to click a button and all of the electronic invitations would be emailed to those who have designated they'd like to vote electronically and they'd be able to activate their account. And um, if the ballot is live, vote right, right then and there. Uh, so it's really not a long process. Uh, if we're setting it up, if we're setting up the ballot, 
we will ask for the ballot as prepared by your attorney. So whatever would typically be sent out, for example, in your second notice, that PDF packet um, that, would, that would either be used to create the paper mailing or the electronic mailing, we'll ask for that because when we create a ballot on behalf of an association, we prefer to copy and paste directly from those materials to avoid any typographical errors and, and we want to validate that. And then of course, no, be able to let the attorney know to review what's been loaded into the system just for, um, you know, to make sure that everything is correct. Uh, but again, it's the, from our perspective, the, the process of getting it all set up is, is fast. I, I typically say 24 hours or less. Uh, but in a pinch, if somebody was at the last minute, uh, you know, I didn't get my voter roster uploaded, uh, you know, it'll be done in, in just a few minutes. It's never, never a tough push. So I think the reality then, David, is the time constraints are really going to come on the association side, selecting a vendor, making the decision, making the decision to go to an electronic voting platform, selecting a vendor, really having the, the association's attorney approve the, ba the ballot and, and things like that, which I think is a good time to again remind people, and I'll do the commercial for David this time, especially <laughs> when you're going through this the first time, you want to be shoulder to shoulder, well, six feet apart, I guess, from your attorney uh, <laughs> yeah. while you're going through this process because you don't want to fail on a technicality. And, and making the investment and having it backfire because you didn't do something small would probably be a mistake. So, you know, kind of that's what we would recommend when you're dotting the I's and crossing the T's, get with your attorney, make sure you have it right, make sure Brett gets the right ballot and, and kind of go from there. Is that a fair summary? It is, Craig. And I, I would say this, um, remember, you're going to reap the benefits with the higher number of owners that consent, of course. And so, you know, there's no problem with deciding six months before your annual meeting that you're going to go through this step because guess what? That then gives you several months to broadcast this to your owners, to get the consent forms out there. Uh, the other real nice part about this is once these forms are up and running, when you have a new owner and you know, they, they get their packet and they come and they sign up to get their, you know, their keys and their codes and all that other good stuff. One more thing you just hand to them and say, hey, here you go. Why don't you sign this to consent to electronic notice, uh, notification for meetings and electronic voting. And then you've captured all those new owners that closed within the six months leading up to the annual meeting. You know, really, you know, candidly, if you're going to be thinking about doing it, really the, the time to start the process is this summer so that you're good to go come the fall and the winter when you have these membership meetings. Right. I think that's great guys. And the other thing I would say to our participants, you know, we do this all the time. We, we integrate, it's our job as a management company to make sure, you know, Brett gets all the stuff he needs to, to execute uh, on the platform. So that is really a big part of our job is making sure that that gets done uh, properly. Okay. So we've decided to go, we're all in. Um, Brett, can, how does it work? Like, what do we do? Sure. Uh, first is sign up for the platform. You can do that online. Uh, it does uh, walk you through a couple of steps to create what we'll refer to as your voting portal. It's a little mini website that's created for your association where the administrator will maintain the voter roster and create the ballot. And it's where your voters are directed to to actually cast their ballot. Uh, they, they see obviously different experiences. Uh, a voter will see all the, all the admin tools. Um, once the account is set up, uh, the vote administrator can download a template for the voter roster and use that or uh, get in touch with us and we will create that, that voter roster from our template. And that template is simply used to, for the bulk upload of all of your voter data. Uh, you can then create the ballot online and those steps can be reversed if you have your ballot but you haven't completed your voter roster. We can create the ballot first. Um, once you've got your ballot created, uh, and your roster is ready to go, you can activate your voters in the system. That sends them an email asking them to uh, activate their account. It's the registration period. Sometimes registration and voting will overlap. Uh, so uh, particularly if you're, you're kind of uh, at the last minute where you want to uh, adopt electronic voting, I've had a handful of those um, in, the, in the, the, this past fall. Um, so they can register and vote essentially at the same time. 
And uh, assuming that's not the case, when the ballot goes live, so when the voting period opens up, the system will automatically send out an email to all the voters registered to vote online, asking them to log in and vote. Uh, in that email, there will also be a link for your voter to watch a quick video about how the vote will work so that if they need that. We also do provide a PDF when um, you sign up for the portal uh, that you can send with your second notice or any of your other materials. Um, that PDF is available and it does provide some, some brief instructions as to what the voter will expect to see. Uh -huh. um, a voter, when they get that email, can log in as long as they're on the internet. So if they're uh, in New Jersey, if they're in Canada, if they're in Florida in their condo and not able to leave, they can log in uh, from their phone, their tablet, uh, or their laptop uh, and vote. Uh, if they haven't voted uh, three days before a vote closes, and again, one day before the vote closes, the system will send them a reminder. We try not to over message people, uh, but we do want to keep it top of mind. I think, uh, and, and obviously I'll defer to David on this, I think there is a requirement of the three-day reminder uh, in the statute. We also do it one day, just, hey, your vote's gonna close tomorrow. You ought to get on there and vote. Uh, we give you a bunch of reports throughout the voting process. So uh, as a vote administrator, if uh, three days into your five-day voting period, you see that only 50% of the people who have registered have voted, we'll give you a list of all the email addresses and you can send them your own reminder as well as wait for the system reminder, just keeping it top of mind. And I know with a few of the smaller associations, they've actually used that to pick up the phone and call as well. Um, we'll also give you status reports as to when people voted. So uh, in the event you receive a paper ballot, uh, you wanna true up the results and make sure somebody hasn't inadvertently voted twice, that data is available to you. And then uh, once the vote closes, uh, within, I say a minute, within a minute of the vote close, your final tallies will be available in the portal as well. So if your vote is uh, closing at, uh, let's say your, your meeting is at uh, 5 p.m. Friday, May 15th, uh, and you've closed your vote at 5 p.m. at 5.01, the vote administrator can log into the portal, see the final vote tallies. You can actually download a a spreadsheet of the vote tallies, which will match what you, what you see on the screen. This way you can use those to integrate with whatever you're using to count your paper tally. So if you have a spreadsheet running to count those paper votes, you can uh, merge those two together uh, just to make that process a little easier for you. Um, so from an administrative standpoint, it's, it's quite easy signing up and managing the process. And a voter really, they get an email, click a link, the ballot launches. They are able to review all the questions. Uh, any attachments uh, can be added to a question. So in the case of um, a budget vote, for example, if you had the budget, a PDF of that would open up in your browser. Uh, in the case of an election, uh, if your candidates have provide candidate information statements, those PDFs will open. You could click on a link next to each person's name. Uh, so it's really all a self-contained experience vote is recorded and then the voter receives an email confirming their their selections. Brett, we're, uh, our association is uh, 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 in, a, in a situation where we're expecting that there, um, there's going to be a contentious election and mm -hmm. we're worried that Tony the treasurer is going to log in three times and vote for himself three times. Uh, how are you ensuring one vote per owner? Right, so in the system, we, we catch that when somebody logs in. So you can only log in if you've got an activated email in the system. So you can't, you can't trick the system into using fake emails. Nobody uh, can register and activate an account that's designated by the, the uploaded voter roster. Uh, and of course, if a voter calls us, uh, and we will always act as frontline support, uh, if a voter calls us and says, hey, I can't log in, we'll check your, your association's voter roster. And if they don't appear in the roster, we redirect them back to the uh, association management and say, you know, you're gonna need to contact them. Maybe uh, you need to fill out a consent to vote online. You know, I don't, I don't uh, presuppose why they're not on the list uh, or if they've been deactivated because, you know, they haven't paid their dues or whatever. I don't, I don't, we don't get into those conversations. I simply redirect them back. Um, so, uh, and then in the case of an election, 
you know, you can't change your, your vote. Our system is very careful that we mark in our database when you've logged in. Once the, you, you have to check a box and click cast your ballot. Once that action has been performed, we lock that email account. So I can't log back in with my same email and cast another vote. If it's not an election, you can uh, change your vote, but you can't vote multiple times. Uh, that's designated by the email address and by the number of properties that you own. So uh, the system's very careful to record each activity. We do time and date stamp each interaction. Um, we do that for, for a bunch of reasons. One, we have to capture that uh, for purposes of locking the account once a vote's been cast. But we also do recognize it's, it's very possible somebody will also submit something on paper. Uh, I like to say inadvertently. Um, and this way, as an administrator, you can determine which vote, you know, I, I, I don't get into the subtleties of, of whether one is good and one isn't, uh, or they're both invalid, but you'll have the data available as to when those votes, votes have been recorded. Right. Craig, uh, you know, one thing I, I want to mention, as we all know, you know, those of us that have worked in the community association industry for a long time, I mean, there's a lot of shenanigans that happen, right? And uh, I have seen many instances where, you know, forgeries on various voting instruments and, you know, I, I could tell a ton of stories. Um, this really does help to prevent shenanigans from occurring because the whole forgery, you know, that, that aspect of it goes away. This is, there's protections already built in. And if someone's trying to do cyber shenanigans, it's going to show up on Brett's radar. Right. We do um, capture that in a report. Um, we also do capture, you know, each, each individual voter receives a receipt and that receipt is emailed to the email on record. So if somebody was able to steal or guess somebody's password uh -huh. and voted on their behalf, that's never happened. But I mean, it's very possible they overhear somebody talking at the pool or on the golf course and they, they go, oh, that's their password. Um, the, the actual email on record is going to receive the vote receipt. So if they get the receipt and they, they realize, oh, I didn't cast that vote, you know, that we can capture that information too. We also generate a list of report of every receipt that's emailed. Now we do anonymize that. So nobody can see, right. oh, you know, David was, you know, I, I see David's email receipt in this report but I do know that a receipt was sent at such a time and such a date, and this was the data recorded in that receipt in the event a vote is ever questioned. So all that data is captured. It's a great question, and, and we did have a participant uh, chat in that, you know, paper ballots are kept for, available for inspection. How are the electronic ballots kept, and, and how are they inspected if I wanted to challenge or have a look at, you know, the, the official records of the association relative to the election? Yeah, let me let me talk first about the legal part of it, and then Brett, you can talk about you know how it actually works. Um, sure. It's important to remember from a legal standpoint that you know yes, there's a process to vote electronically, but the old rules regarding you know paper balloting and things like that are still in play. It's just an electronic vote as opposed to a paper vote. So, for example, we still have to maintain uh, the the ballots in case there's a challenge. Uh, you know. I mentioned earlier about some of the nuances that were adopted after the law was established in 2015. Many of those nuances helped address how this is going to work when you actually do have a challenge. So just because you vote electronically doesn't mean that somebody can't challenge 30 days later the results. They, they still can, and there's a mechanism put in place to deal with that. And, and Brett, I'll let you take it away on the, the, the cyber aspect of that. For sure. We do save the results of every single vote that's conducted in the system historically. And uh, just by way of uh, potentially another question around security or data integrity, that data is kept separate from every other association's data. So when you sign up for your uh, association uh, to vote online, a separate database is created for each association. So no data is ever commingled, either vote, association, or voter data. That data for every vote is saved historically in the system. So you can always go back to a vote that was conducted 
last fall, last year, five years ago. As long as it was conducted in the system, the data is preserved. You can spit out a spreadsheet of all of your voter data, so the, the generic tallies, uh, the voter participation data, and you can generate both a spreadsheet and a PDF of the vote receipts, which are essentially the ballots. Now, we don't generate what would be equivalent to a paper ballot because you're not voting on paper. But when you cast your ballot online, you receive an email receipt, which looks like what you would have filled out online and on paper. So it's the, the record of that vote. And you have that for your own personal records. Right. We will generate a PDF of every single one of those receipts that was sent out, which is essentially every ballot cast. Um, since it's not on paper, we don't do that on paper, but you can clearly print that out if you like. Uh, but it is a PDF of every single receipt. Now, what we do, just like you would have your, your ballot in hand, is we do anonymize that. So I don't record whose receipt it is, just that we have the receipt and we do have a, a unique ID, which is recorded when the vote is cast in the database. That is on the receipt, but there's no way for anybody who has that information to match that anonymous ID with with the person. Um, right, so all that's just, so there is a trail, there are records that somebody can inspect because we know in Florida how much board members and residents love to inspect records. Um, <laughs> David, I wanna get back to, elect, to election night for a second. It's election night, we close the portal, the electronic voting stops at five. Now we have the printout from uh, Brett of who what casts their vote and who they voted for. Now I need to go through the process of matching that up against or matching it, aligning it, or, or adding adding all the manual votes to it. You provided over presided over elections. How, what does that look like, David? Right. So the way it looks like is, you know, outside of those clients that have 100% participation, right, which is is very few. Uh, right. The way it's going to look like for most of you all that are logging in and getting started on this is you're going to have your electronic voting results, and then you're going to have your old school paper process, the same process we've been using for decades, right? So you go about your meeting, you do the exact same thing you would have normally done. Uh, the differences are going to be there's less envelopes sitting there on your table, there's less pieces of paper, uh, but you're going to still go through that same process. And then you're going to reconcile the electronic votes with the paper votes, right? And candidly, there's a couple of different ways you can, you can handle that. You know, Brett, I don't know if you want to, uh, to chat about that, but, but before we segue to Brett in, in terms of how that works, uh, you know, someone's going to need to have a laptop available, you know, so they can obviously see what the latest electronic vote tally is. Um, I know with Becker Ballot, there, you know, there are options to uh, have a moderator, you know, have, have somebody uh, show up to actually handle the electronic side of things. Um, but as long as your manager or your president or whoever's going to lead the charge as far as bringing the laptop, you know, it's, it is user friendly. So they bring the laptop, they log in, you know, they are the administrator, they will see the tally right there. And so they'll look at their screen and they'll say, all right, we have 32 electronic votes, right? And if it's in the election of directors, here are the results, anonymous results, of course, if we're voting on amendments, here are the results. And then you, reconcile with the paper balloting, you put it together and then you announce the results of the election. Who won the election, whether the amendment passed, all that good stuff. And, and, and Brett, why don't you talk a little bit about how you do that? Uh, you know, are they punching in the data from the paper balloting into the system? Are they not? What are you seeing when you attend these meetings? Yeah, the, the way we do it right now, we've, we've talked a little bit about building um, some additional functionality for a more comprehensive uh, tool, and I can speak to that, a reporting tool. Um, I can speak to the, the features that will be included, and it does anticipate that you'll upload an entire voter roster, not just the voters who have consented. Um, it's really quite simple. You log in as the vote administrator, go to the reports tab, um, and the results one minute after the vote closes will animate on screen. So your tally will be on a web page right in front of you in a chart. There's also a button to download a spreadsheet 
of that vote tally. So we give you a couple of different ways. You may want to read off the results on the screen and then manually enter them into your spreadsheet that you've been keeping for your, your paper count. I've had a lot of associations do it that way because they have a standard approach to doing their paper counts um, at their meetings. Alternatively, you can download the spreadsheet that, that we provide, which breaks down each question and the results, the count for each question and then the total count. And you can merge your results into that spreadsheet. Uh, really whatever mechanism is easier for your association, but the data is available. It's a click away. Um, and as you've said, as long as you've got a, a, a laptop there at the meeting and you've, you're connected to the web, uh, those results are, are available instantaneously to you. And um, I think the chart is very easy to read. So it makes it quite simple to visually see the results and then download the data so you can merge it with your count, your, your paper count. I think, I think all that to say there are tools, which is great. That is your management company's job. If you have a management company, it is your attorney's job to support that, you know, uh, if you go through this process. But it sounds like those are great uh, tools. One concern, uh, you know, our community is, is a 55 and better community, and I'm no computer genius myself. And I know we have people that will be viewing this for the first time. What, what kind of support can we expect from the vendor of choice for us? Well, I can tell you what we do. And, and you know, there are, there are some competitors in market. I, you know, we've tried to lead with support. Uh, and I know that our, our model has evolved. We've, we've added more folks uh, to the team. We have an 800 number right on the BeckerBattle.com website. There's a, a chat bot that will message us in real time. We like to tell our associations uh, that we will act as your frontline support. Uh, there's really no reason why a board member or a property manager needs to deal with all the technical questions. Uh, it's your job to manage the associations and, and help gain adoption. But once you've got folks who have indicated they want to vote online and they uh, lose their password or inadvertently delete the email invitation, or just generally have a question about how the whole thing works, we just ask that you direct them to us and we will jump on a call. We will um, answer questions via email. Uh, as I said, we will help them reset a password. We will point them to, on how to do that. Uh, if, if we've come across somebody who's not in the voter roster, we will redirect them gently to their association management to make sure that they get, um, they get the appropriate paperwork filled out. But uh, we, you know, I, the folks that I've been dealing with really run the gamut. You know, I've got folks who are certainly older, you know, uh, who are, who are um, retired, who may not have even been in a, in a uh, profession where they use a computer regularly, who have taken to this quite quickly because they're excited about the notion of being able to do these things online. So with maybe a quick conversation, they're up and voting. Um, and then I have people who really need a lot of help, who simply don't understand the process. Um, the vast majority of people seem to take to it quite quickly. You're right, the very first time that people do this, you will have the most, the most questions. So they will need the most support. Right. Uh, well, that's good. I appreciate there's a safety net for me uh, when my <laughs> association decides to uh, implement the, the platform. A uh, quick question, a quick hit if I can. Do you, if you had to guess what percentage of owners ultimately uh, elect, to a vote, elect to vote electronically, what kind of percentage are we looking at? you think? Do you have that data? Uh, you know, I don't have it across the board for, for every association. Probably a good metric for me to look at and see what the adoption rate has been. But I, I think we're trending in the 75, 80% adoption once we get past the initial couple of questions. Right. Um, the vast majority of associations that have signed up to vote electronically seem to very quickly get adoption. Uh, but they are also, most have been diligent in, you know, tracking, tracking their voters down and, and really asking for them to participate. Sure. So I think you got to give folks a gentle nudge, you know, make it easy for them, give them a support line, uh, you know, a, a, a clear line of support, not just a phone number to support, right. a clear line of support. And then, you know, make sure that you are on them during the open vote period, encouraging them to participate. Um, I think that's, that's, uh, that is great data. Guys, I would say one of the things we recommend at Castle is if you're going to do this, especially the first time, but really all the times, 
and you should really have your attorney there because you know there's the guy who questions everything and there's going to be things that come up and the matching of votes and what if we got a paper vote and a and a and a electronic vote and my wife and I each have an email address you're going to get those types of questions they're going to come up the night of the meeting so our recommendation is you have someone there who can take the emotion out of these types of things and just okay from a factual standpoint here's what we're doing this is you know we're going to we're going to not allow this, but we're going to allow that one. So, David, I'm sure you'll agree that we should have an attorney there. Um, but uh, but uh, it is a great idea, and it's something we certainly recommend as, as a management company. I, I, I think it's a no-brainer to consult with your attorney to get everything started and to go over the nuances, because as we know, each community is, is different. The first time you vote, using electronic voting, it's, it's good to have you know, the attorney there as well. You know, but, but candidly, I've got clients now that have done this two, three times, yes. uh, two, three annual meetings in a row, and it's second nature to them. And I went to the first annual meeting to help them with it, and then the training wheels were off, and uh, you know, they, I've had no issues with them since then. Fantastic. Okay, guys, I do want to get costs. A lot of people are asking about um, it, and, and Brett, you and I spoke uh, yesterday in prepping for this webinar, and from what I understand, there are kind of two tiers to your platform. Uh, tier one is a single voting event, right? One election costs between $300 and $750. Tier two is multiple voting events, which is more like an annual description, annual subscription, excuse me, which is somewhere between $700 and $1,100. I will say for full, for full disclosure that the lower end of the range is reserved for Becker clients because they have negotiated a preferred pricing program for their clients. But do I have the rights, do I have the rates right? Um, and are they competitive in the market? How does that sound? You do, yeah. I think we are we are pretty competitive in the market. There are a handful of competitors out there, and obviously, I would expect, given everything that we're seeing now, we'll we'll see a handful more come come in market. Uh, we've had the benefit of um, of being in market for a while, and obviously, the partnership with Becker, uh, you're really the leader in this area, is has been beneficial to us both from an adoption standpoint, but also from um, an assurance that we've got the features right, you know, that, that we're, we're satisfying the requirements. Um, I think our pricing is competitive. I think the fact that we don't price things based on number of voters or blocks of voters makes the pricing a little bit more uh, appropriate. We don't, there aren't, any, there aren't any hidden costs. So, you know, when I say that support is free, <laughs> You know, you can call us as often as you want. Your, your voters can call us whatever they need to. Uh, we also do set the, the, there's no charge to set your ballot up um, or to set your, your voter roster up. And I know that a few of the competitors out there do have a setup fee. We, we really don't think that that's something that's necessary. And given the fact that we've built tools that are intended for you to manage, we're using essentially the same tools. We've, we've tried to make that process uh, easy. So uh, we, I do think the pricing is competitive and I think the, the feature set is competitive. On the subscription side, we do also offer a survey tool, which is a little bit of an added value tool, um, which can be helpful for, for associations who want to take that pulse of the community. Right. And so, um, Brett, who are your, who are your main, main competitors? Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I see Vote HOA now, OnRap, uh, Election Runner. Those are the ones that I see crop up uh, quite a bit. Um, and they've been election, election runner and uh, voting portals.com, I think have been around for a while. Um, you know, Becker ballad came into market was probably one of the very first of the kind in market probably now five years ago. Um, software was just getting a little long in the long in the tooth needed a few feature updates. We wanted to make a mobile version of it. So we relaunched it as Becker ballad. Uh, about a year ago, and I think we enjoy uh, the reputation and the fact that that you know we we learned the process uh, early on. Uh, I think you know relative to the folks that I've mentioned, I think our, our our pricing is competitive. I think our support is is pretty terrific, um, and the fact that we'll essentially take it from beginning to end for you uh, is, is helpful as well, but, you know, do your due diligence. There, there are a number of tools out there. It really, it's incumbent upon the association and the management to find a fit, you know, both from a technology standpoint, but also you have to feel comfortable with the vendor. You know, you have to feel like the vendor 
will answer your questions, can help you set it up, can generate the report for you in a pinch. Um, you know, you want to make sure you have all those pieces in place. Uh, appreciate that, guys. We are we're narrowing down on our time, and we've got some great questions. I want to go kind of five more minutes if that works for you, and then uh, and then we'll kind of wind it up. I I really wanted to hit on you know we've done a lot of discussion on electronic voting. There are other opportunities to use the platform, really any vote. And I think the one we see the most is, is voting on amendments. So Brett, can you just take me through kind of the platform features relative to, this is an any yes or no vote platform, correct? It is, yeah. Uh, so absent, let's, uh, we'll take the elections. We've talked a lot about those. Obviously the platform supports um, your, your, your standard elections, but a reserve, uh, an amendment, an alteration, uh, any vote where you'd have a yes, no, a firm deny type of selection um, is supported in the system. Uh, reserve votes in Florida do require some additional language. So for any, any of the folks on the phone who have done a reserve vote, they've received that ballot from their attorney. There's an extra paragraph that always appears above or below the question. Our system will insert that into the ballot for you. Um, and, and then any attachments that you would send out or that your voters would need to review in the decision-making process can also be uploaded and attached to each individual question on a ballot. I always say upload those as a PDF uh, because you can open up a PDF in your browser without any additional software. Um, you know, if you inadvertently attach a Word doc and your voter doesn't have Word, uh, they're going to download a document they can't, they can't do anything with, uh, can't read. So, um, so really any vote type that you would anticipate um, on a standard voting ballot uh, can be supported in, in our platform. And I would expect um, most other electronic voting platforms should be able to do that as well. What we've seen participants is we've seen a lot of success getting those uh, amendments that you always wanted to get done that you couldn't kind of compel the, the community to step up and take interest in that we've used uh, you know, a tool like Brett's to say, okay, we, we know as we approach who's voted, and so you can, I think we can log on to your platform and determine who hasn't. And Correct. then we can take that as a management company and go follow up with those people because it's really not, they don't want to vote. They just, life is busy, right? So we've been, had a lot of success using the platform to be able to kind of reconnect with the community as we approach the, you know, the minimum vote requirement. So I'm sure a lot of your, your clients have seen that. David, um, you know, this happens a lot, right? We get to the meeting, we're short votes. What can we do? Uh, do we, can we adjourn that meeting to another date and go search down the people that didn't vote? Right, so again, this is an example of where just because you're voting electronically doesn't mean some of the other benefits and, and, and things that the law provides disappear. You still have, and we all know that proxies are good for 90 days, right? Uh, so there's still an opportunity to reconvene your membership meeting to a later date and time to go solicit additional proxies, additional votes to try to get to that threshold you need to pass the amendments. And in fact, I mean, I, I've, I've had that happen numerous times with clients who are voting electronically and they had to reconvene for, uh, for a month or two to get those additional votes. The, the, the system allows for that and it's, it's really not a big deal. It's, it's the same process that you used to use. You're just having the added benefit of cyber votes, cyber voting. Right. Okay, guys, well, listen, we're going to wind up. I want to thank you for joining me this afternoon. Very informative, uh, guys, on the, on the whole electronic platform. I've learned a lot through this process, and I do appreciate that. Uh, before I close, um, is there anything we really didn't get to today that you wanted to mention to our participants? Uh, Brett, uh, let me start with you. Uh, no, I think, you know, we, we, we covered everything, main features, you know, one of the things that we are rolling out, just since we are pandemic focused, <laughs> you know, the, the tool was rolled out, not anticipating this. Uh, certainly, I think it's helpful now that we all can't physically be together. Um, we have rolled out in beta in our tool, uh, a video conferencing add-on. Oh. Um, so... It hasn't been activated. It is available for every met, every um, association who has signed up so that if uh, they can't conduct their meeting in person but would like to invite folks to participate virtually, right from our platform, you could spin up a uh, Zoom-like, we don't use Zoom, it's a Zoom-like uh, video conferencing tool that would allow you to either share your screen 
or share your web camera. We, you know, we are trying to constantly add value, add features. We do recognize this is absolutely a challenging time and we want to make sure folks have the ability to still collaborate and still meet even though you can't physically be together. So it's something that we're, we're, we're you know, we're gauging the interest um, to see if, if, if folks uh, do want it, we'll use it. And if so, we'll probably make it a more formal piece of the tool um, down the road. But, but if anybody on, on the call is currently using our software and is interested in giving it a try, just ping me and I'll, I'll happily activate it in your portal so you can play around with it and, you know, call, call your family, call your friends, just give it a try, make sure it works for you. Um, call it what you want for mind. dinner. I mean, there's all kinds right, of yeah, We don't have a virtual uh, poker game. We don't mind who you're, who you're meeting with. Just give it a try to make sure it, it, it will satisfy your association's needs. That's, uh, that's funny, uh, Brad, and that sounds really cool. Quick, uh, we have a couple of people asking, how big is your uh, client base? Uh, so, you know, we relaunched the platform in September. That was when the newest version went live. And I think since September, we have had over 100 votes. 100, 100 uh, uh, votes have been cast. I can get the exact number. Um, there are more, uh, obviously more associations signed up, not all of whom have actually performed a vote yet had a ballot line right. yet um and the vast majority of them we have worked with directly i haven't set up every single ballot or, or voter roster but i've at least had contact with a representative of, of probably almost every association that has conducted a vote during that that time frame fantastic good uh david any last word yeah i think the the last word is you know this doesn't have to be a scary thing uh with the COVID-19 pandemic, it really has, uh, it's accelerating our advancement into the cyber voting. And, you, you know, one thing too, for those board members out there, you, you know, candidly, this, this has been kind of an unexpected part of this, but there's this quasi status <laughs> aspect to this where boards who have done it and then it's been successful, you know, their owners think about those board members and say, wow, they, they offered this new way to vote and it's, it's so cool. And, you know, I've even heard some of my clients say, you know, when they're, uh, the, the marketing of, of the community, you know, it, it, it does add to the, the status of it where owners, you know, know that you're going to be voting electronically. I mean, it's, I, I call it the Jetsons effect, I guess. I, I don't know, but there, there is kind of a status element to it. And uh, that's been one of the unexpected parts of this, but it's, it's kind of a cool part. Well, guys, listen, again, thank you very much. Uh, to everyone who listened in, we really appreciate it. If you do have any questions, you can uh, email them to me at info at castlegroup.com. We'd be happy to, to get out. We didn't get to all the questions, and those we can also, uh, we'll uh, Zoom out some, uh, or we'll email out some responses to you. Guys, I really appreciate it. Uh, everybody stay healthy, safe, and, and remember to vote electronically. That's what I would like <laughs> close with. So uh, have a great thank afternoon. You. Take care. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. So long.